Hello and welcome. Uh, we're just having a quick switch over to this next session. Clearly, we're having a few technical issues. So uh, this session uh, we'll, we'll get on with straight away, not to keep you uh, waiting. The session that uh, we're focusing on today is logistics automation. Um, and I'm joined by uh, by Rodney Salmon and, uh, and of course, uh, with uh, Balakrishnan uh, from uh, from Ford as well. So, Ronnie, let's uh, let's get straight into it. I know you've got uh, uh, got some uh, some slides, and for you, Balakrishna, we're uh, pleased to have you both here. So, uh, I know you've got some slides there, Balakrishna. Uh, let's start with you. Let's start with you, Rodney, and uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, start with the presentation. Thanks very much. Okay, can we move on to the next one, please? At, uh, okay, so we're talking about automation and robotics, particularly today. Um, and I'm focusing really on the packaging size because automation is relevant in this side due to the stronger demand in, in fragmentation of orders, multiple SKUs, a reduction investment um, availability at line side. Um, we are seeing a huge amount of, of push now towards robots coming onto line side. Can you change, please? So we're expecting over 4 million jobs um, to be replaced by robots on line side within the next uh, 10 years. The investment within robots um, is actually coming down. Robots are obviously uh, more sophisticated, but the price of robots is coming down. So 80 to uh, 100,000 K on euros. And then we're seeing a 20, 40% cost reduction in handling thanks to robots and cobots. Can we move to the next one? So 20 to 40 percent saving in handling costs, which is not surprising because robots uh, don't like holidays, they don't fall ill that often, and they operate 24-7. And as I've mentioned before, the reduce, reduce uh, equipment um, is versus the rising wage costs. Can we move on? So we're already seeing with the high development of high pressure injection molding and technology that's come into this industry, that we can now produce trays like these at line side with a tolerance of, of plus or minus half a millimeter. This means that basically the robots can come in and they can pick the parts out of the, of the packaging and then remove the tray and, and make the next tray available for the packaging. And this can be fed at, directly onto the, the powertrain plant engine or onto the car or even given to the operator at line side. Um, this is, um, and then on the next one, thank you. So this is a particular frame tray or chocolate tray as it's called. And it's quite simple. This is, this is used at line side, a uh, number of trays. You can see the pack density there is, is immense compared with previous um, when it was um, picked out of a metal stillage. Um, these trays are actually only used once, even though they look returnable, they're only used once. They're ground down after each trip and they're sent back down to the supplier, as you can see in the bags and material on the bottom left-hand corner, and the pallets and the lids are stacked together. The trays are then remade, and then they're put onto the, onto, back to the tier supplier to supply into the plant again. We're also seeing, um, on the next slide, please, an image. So we're seeing here, um, picked by robot, again, as described that the plus or minus of, of half a millimeter or high pressure injection molding is so important to the robots being picked out and you'll see that the, we're moving over especially with regard to evs on a lot less metal stillages and much more plastic stillages the plastic stillages are saving um, around about 80 kilos um, per bin um, plastic to to um, from metal um, and plastic is available now in high pressure injection molding folding containers right up to 1.8, 1.9 meters and taking 900 kilos. And these products are available at the supply chain now. Um, I think one OEM has particularly um, come up with a replacement of 72,000 metal stillages. Um, and each trip those metal, those 72,000 metal trip stillages do, they save 5.4 million kilos in weight on their trucks. So there you can see a huge demand going forward for robots and also the huge cost savings that are available within the supply chain coming up. Thanks, Nimish.
Thanks, Rodney. That's uh, that's great. Thank you very much. There. Let's uh, let's have a quick chat with uh, with Bala because uh, uh, I know uh, we've got uh, uh, we've got uh, a hard stop for you, Bala. So uh, you know, yeah. let's let's ju just have a conversation about uh, you know some of the things that you're doing there at, at Ford. I know you've been doing some extensive work on materials flow and packaging. So why don't you just give us an overview of what you've been doing on that side of things? Sure. Maybe you can share the. PowerPoint, Nimish. Yeah, you can you can start, and uh, my colleague will bring that. Okay, up. okay, okay. So basically, what we are doing um, in continuation of what Rodney was saying in terms of the logistics automation, especially in the metal flow and packaging engineering, this is more focusing. What is the current trends and what are all the future opportunities? Next slide, please. Okay, so material flow. A value chain um, basically it talks about information flow, what flows from OEM to supplier, and also what flows from uh, supplier to manufacturer, right? And we have three stages. The first stage is from supplier. It flows through the OEM warehouse, and from warehouse, it goes to the line side. And that's basically your inbound as well as your in-plant logistics, how it gets connected. From the logistics from supplier and then dock handling, storage, and material uh, movements, and then delivery to um, line side, all that is captured as part of metal flow. And uh, next slide, please. OK, so from the technology enablers and opportunity perspective, we see uh, this is the current scope of various technologies used in this area. Right, right, like transport management system, GPS, window scheduling, all these technologies we use basically at OEM marketplace, how we can get this material on a required quantity and right on time, okay? And then how to store this, what technologies we use in automated storage, vertical carousel, very narrow aisle, like in terms of how to reduce the gap between the two vertical racks, and with the technology, how we can make use of that. Uh, all that is being followed there and warehouse management systems. And once we have that from the marketplace, how we take it up to the OEM um, line side, I think that's where you have pick to light, scanning, vision picking, and, various, and an autonomous delivery. So these are all various technologies right from your supplier doorstep until the point of fit how it can be connected. And with the complexity is increasing, uh, where you need to make multiple models in the same assembly line, that's where this technology is very, very important and useful to avoid all those, what you call the uh, NVA processes and the resources. Next slide. Yeah, I touched upon that already. Next slide. <clears throat> Now, from the packaging perspective, we see the integration with supply chain uh, more from what you call um, the market side, flow side, environment side, and the labeling and traceability, like track and trace as an example, uh, how we connect using the packaging from supplier doorstep to the point of it, how and where the pack is currently located, right? That's a technology influence there. Similarly, the digital pre-assembly and design for logistics at marketplace, like before you launch any new model, what we can do using the technology. Similarly, the flow side in terms of in-plan logistics and unpacking areas, what we can follow from the flow aspect. And, and on the environment side, what materials we use? Can we reuse our assets? Can we bring uh, different material instead of say thermocol? Can we bring something else which is more user friendly to the environment? And what Rodney's indication in terms of moving the chocolate trays instead of the stillage, steel stillage is a classic example, how we can improve the environment and emission, reduce the emission. Next slide, please. And we also practice the robotic process, uh, the automation, in terms of what we can do virtually. And thank to COVID, I can say in one way, because we were able to manage a lot of virtual things, a lot of ideas coming up. And in terms of uh, density in a given pack, um, how we can orient the part so that we can increase the pack density. And we are using that using a simulation and through it engaging the bot 
and giving the feedback to supply base so that we can minimize the freight cost. That's the thought process. Similarly, the packaging approval process, if we have a standard attributes are given, it's all manually managed with number of parts from each plant location across the four sites. It's all handled centrally today uh, and the decision making the robot does already. So that's uh, some of the process automation we engaged in packaging. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. OK, uh, this is going to be my last slide. Basically, it is talks about your enablers um, now, near, and far, what technologies, what automation tools that we can bring. In case of now, like we talked about robotic process automation, there is a strong need for additive manufacturing uh, where we can bring a lot of testing and uh, the physical requirements we can eliminate by introducing the additive. Uh, manufacturing uh, requirements, uh, production basically, and also the big data analytics. All this comes under our now uh, category. In the near category, we see from the augmented reality uh, how we can use the virtual cycle line layout uh, so that when we bring a new model into the into the plant, how we can virtually do. And that's where you try to ac um, accompany the digital twin wherever possible there uh, to assess the simulation and also at the same time virtually how you can walk through in the fl floor space. Um, and the far especially in digital twin application and asset management and blockchain. Okay, blockchain is something new. It is well used in banking sector and financial sectors now, but using in automotive uh, sector, we see as an opportunity, but we need to do a th thorough pilot study, data privacy, security, and all that stuff. And then engaging the AI, uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning, so this is another uh, aspect that we can think of in terms of the deciding the racks. OK, so can system intelligently do when you bring the complexity in terms of bringing the electric vehicle, autonomous vehicle, you have different categories of parts you're bringing, what we can do using the technology and influence. OK, I think the next slide talks about a brief summary. I think I covered it, most of it. I need not go through this. But what I'm saying is through this session, um, I thought I mean, from the view viewer's perspective, if you have some other better ideas, feel free to share. And once again, thanks for the opportunity given uh, to me to highlight this in this uh, session. Thank you. Over to you, Nimish. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bala. It's really interesting to hear, you know, what you're working on and how you're trying to innovate. I guess, you know, part of the challenge for you is because, of course, you represent the international markets groups, right? So, yep. you know, how do you balance this up between you know, implementing this in 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 the across those regions, right? I mean, you're talking about India, South America. Uh, it's a huge challenge. <laughs> it's a huge challenge because if you see each market, you have different trailer dimension, the truck dimension. If you're trying to standardize something in packaging at one place, you can't suit. You can't get the freight efficiency across the globe, right? So because it, it changes and also your bill of process changes from each location to location, your supplier capability differentiates. For some plant, it is in-house, some plant, it is supplier uh, bought out parts. So uh, I think that's where the challenge lies and what we are slowly doing, wherever possible, we are optimizing and we are not taking the past data. We are just focusing the future models so that the, for the future model, you see the assessment, do the market study and try to bring wherever possible the standardization. So I can say um, the mar market to market differentiation is one of the key thing, the historical, the space uh, in the plant, which de determines various aspects of it and the market demand. It varies time to time. You decide today with one, but maybe six months down the line, it may not be the same, right? So when you're trying to standardize, say, in packaging, you be returnable packaging versus expendable packaging, it differentiates. So that's where we have challenges today. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you go about balancing that uh, the, the cost element of this, right? Because you've always got the cost of implementing te technology versus, of course, you know, uh, the reason why you're in these markets is because of the advantage of, of lower cost labor and things like that, right? 
Yeah. See, the, basically, the uh, equation is the business case, right? You have to get uh, your uh, uh, annual return. Um, there is a return of investment. And when you're trying to bring some new technology, and the technology has to interface with the uh, uh, very old uh, systems, what we use in our Ford, and when you start interfacing that, there is a lot of interface cost associated. So wherever possible, you try to get a standalone system and whether the standalone system is able to manage the efficiency of what we are trying to do, I think that's where we are focusing on. And if you take RPA as an example, we have UiPath, we have Pega and all the various platforms. And looking at the longer term, when you really want to attach the factory of uh, tomorrow uh, with the Pega application, I think that's where we are heading towards so that what we can do differently in factory of tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, having the ability to have all that data and, you know, the ability to have a digital twin allows you to to map out the optimal uh, process for that. Right. And and absolutely. optimal layout. And and that's yeah. uh, that's really where the advantage lies. I'm not sure if you if you have to go right now, Bala, or if you can stick around for a little while. Uh, I can I stick around for two, two to three minutes uh, because I asked my team to just let me know once they're ready with it. Just okay. two to three minutes is okay, yeah. <laughs> sure, okay. Well, let me ask you one question. I know we can probably keep Rodney around for a little bit longer as well, and we'll have a chat with you, Rodney. But, you know, I guess one of the other things there is, is you know, when do you when do you th when do you think you'll be in that position where you have that uh, where you have that uh, seamless system or, or in place, right? Yeah. You know, how far down the low down the road is it? Yeah, we see we had started looking now with the with the globalization with the, I mean with the COVID coming in, we always get two different uh, answers. One is is real global supply chain is going to work going forward or we need to go back the traditional way and the respective markets managing it, right? But what we are trying to do here is uh, uh, design services centrally we can manage globally. Okay, that's what uh, we have uh, the Chennai location where we start engaging across all the Ford facilities. We understand what is the total assets we use and how we can reuse the assets effectively so that we need not invest every time. All those synergies are getting handled now using the design involvement. So in my view, at least for next five years, uh, we will be going through this journey and it is also connected with the factory of tomorrow, the technologies that we are trying to bring and the digital twin and using the virtual augmented reality and virtual reality, what you can do centrally sitting here and manage uh, some uh, sign off process like a material flow sign off process or packaging sign off process, which connects your uh, what you call the manufacturing engineering, your plant systems, multiple stakeholders involved with that. Right. I think that's the thought. That's the vision. But we need to really march towards and, and investment is equally important, right? So, and that's where this automation helps. If it is a low cost automation available, which can facilitate all those aspects of it, I think we can do really wonders. And then that's what we are trying to do. And we are also engaging our vendors, your tier one, tier two supply base, so that not only we doing it, how it goes into the, across the supply chain, which is also equally important. Yeah, sure. Well, look, thank you very much, uh, Balo. Great to have you here. We'll, of course, yeah. follow up. We're in contact and, you know, let's let's continue this discussion and, uh, uh, thank and, and you. it'd be interesting to see how this develops further. So I'll let you go and uh, Rodney and I can uh, can have a, a bit more uh, uh, a conversation about this as well. So, so Rodney, what, what are your thoughts on this? Of course, you know, you, you're, you've been in the packaging world for a while, so you deal with Ford quite a lot uh, in in, in as well. So what are your thoughts on, on how this is going? And thanks for the presentation there as well. There were some interesting elements that in there as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, there's a lot happening since COVID. I think that, that the great thing about this conference showed is actually COVID's been, COVID's probably still with us. Um, but actually, things are getting back to normal again, which is very encouraging. Uh, and we've seen the opportunities for the future. I think the, the the first presentation we had on Tuesday morning from Volvo said there's never been a more exciting time to be in the industry than right now. And, and I'm an absolute pro with that. That's definitely it. Um, I think that, that, that moving forward and moving automation in and robotics and co-robotics into the line side is obviously a lot of investment, especially as there's huge amount of investments we've held from Volkswagen recently. 
um, you know, 50, 50 billion euros with regard to batteries and uh, 68, 69 million euro, billion euros with regard to investment in AV, EV plants. Um, it's a case of which, where does the money come from and, and how do they do it? Um, the other element, of course, is that stopping change is time. Um, especially in the packaging industry where you've got a lot of packaging engineers that maybe say, well, let's go with the same old, let's go with the same old thing because we just haven't got time to really um, prove out this new, this new um, uh, project or this new form of packaging, which is a shame because there's huge savings to be made. And, um, you know, especially with um, lighter parts coming in with electric vehicles, there's no need to move um, product any more longer in heavy metal silages. You know, we've got to stop poisoning the supply chain. Um, all the OEMs have had massive fines for um, not complying with emissions. Well, packaging is the same. OK, we don't have to um, spend lo a lot of money on, on uh, you know, huge loads, weights going into vehicles and uh, saving this, this massive amount of um, weight that we can possibly do right now. It's not something that we've got to spend a lot of time on. It's something that's available now. We can do it right away. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting uh, part of the conversation, right? I think, you know, as we talk about kind of innovations in terms of technology and digital twins and those kind of things, there are, you know, as you say, practical things that we can do today to help, you know, dry, help you know, with, with uh, container and uh, asset utilization, you know, reducing your CO2 footprint and using innovative technologies to, to, to help drive that efficiency and save costs, right? Ultimately, you know, logistics is, is, is a cost center in that respect. So, you know, and, and of course we heard yesterday in, in, in the packaging center, in the packaging uh, session uh, about uh, utilizing ocean plastics and recycling and those kind of things. You know, these are all things that can be done now, right, uh, Bobby? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the, you're no longer in the, with the technology that's come in from plastics. I mean, even into, you know, powertrain parts being made out of plastic now in, within the engines and uh, with the battery technology coming in and, and with the innovation there, there's a huge amount of plastics coming in and plastics technology has moved forward dramatically and it's had to. Um, so that there's a lot of lot of work that, and a lot of projects that are available right now. You know, we're seeing um, within the automotive industry and within the packaging industry, we now have to no longer have to wait for a part to design. Everything's 3D printed, and it's perfect yeah. because you can speed up the process dramatically with that, and deliver packaging and deliver parts. And the pack densities in, inside we're seeing increasing dramatically with the amount of parts that you get in per vehicle, the amount of parts that you can put line side within the vehicle with, within the within the packaging, and and. Uh, the, the the demand is there and it's 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 and also the the, the technology is there already so let's get on and use it yeah and i think you know going back to what bala was saying as, as well right i mean even if it's talking about implementing technology or implementing these types of solutions it's about the business case right and and uh, putting that business case forward how, how do you find you know presenting that business case and what are the challenges around around that well the the, the the challenge is, is first of all getting the engine the, the packaging engineers at the tier suppliers and OEMs basically getting their time to actually show them and help them understand exactly how we can move forward in in, in a better environment better pack densities um, and they then have their challenges when they're going to purchasing because when you when you know purchasing is, isn't all about the cheapest price okay and we heard yesterday's session, okay, that, that, you know, packaging sometimes doesn't last the life of a vehicle seven or eight years. It's gone, some, you know, if it's bad packaging, it, 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 you have to replace it after two to three years. So it's understanding and, and getting purchasing to understand that it's not always the cheapest method that's the best method and actually the most economical. Um, but it's good that we're seeing sustainability um, now uh, coming into p purchasing and then having a much better understanding of sustainability within the supply chain and getting to grips with the cost savings overall. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we we have to, you know, it's 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 no longer a discussion, right, about whether we should or, or you know, it's it's now we must, right, we must, you know, take these steps, you know, because there's no other alternative, you know, we, we have to uh, for, 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 
for the planet and for uh, for the future right i think that's uh, that's the key you know so so let's uh, let's get these things moving and let's let's start to uh, drive these changes yeah i think uh, i think uh, of course as as you said as well you know the, the disruption that's been caused by by covid is actually making people you know think twice and and rethink all these processes um, there's of course that drive towards uh, electric vehicles, but then what that also poses a number of other challenges in terms of uh, you know hazardous materials and those kind of things. So lots of lots of things to talk about. So we've probably got about a minute left, uh, Rodney. So I'll, I'll I'll let you have I'll let you have uh, thirty seconds of that to, to to just you know with some final comments on on what you'd like to see happen next. Well, certainly I'd like to see um, innovation move forward. I'd like to see progress through the supply chain, um, especially with the tier suppliers and OEMs with line side packaging um, and looking at pack densities and looking at the overall um, cost, not just over initial supply, but overall the, the, the vehicle life cost. So they can see that the, the purchasing people can see that there is a huge cost to be made, not necessarily by buying the cheapest material that will fail after two to three years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Rodney. It's been a pleasure having you. Uh, again, uh, apologies for the uh, the technical problems that we've had uh, today, but you know this this is the world we live in, where we're adapting to 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 different anomalies as as uh, uh, as as the uh, logistics and supply chain has to as well. So um, the next session for us will start at uh, eleven thirty, where we have uh, a one to one interview uh, with uh, Monica Schmickler from from Daimler AG and she'll be talking about accelerating digital transformation in Finnish vehicle logistics. So uh, time to uh, grab a, a, a coffee, a drink, and uh, we'll, we'll see you back here at, uh, at, at 11.30. Rodney, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.